I lose three brothers of mine, which was shot in one day. They were found in the house, so they are all killed. Well, empty men move certain night. They go and rape. If they enter a house like this of Francis, they rape Francis and they rape the Why if they rape even the children? Honestly. It's not seeing different pictures of men. Somebody is on top of you, somebody is somewhere, somebody has already erected there. <laughs> For over 200 years, the South Sudanese have known two words, war and plunder. Centuries of enslavement by Northern Sudan and Egypt, then colonization and deliberate underdevelopment by the British. When independence came to Sudan in 1956, the South was once again denied the right to self-rule. Then came more war. The wars were made worse by the discovery of oil in the south. They fought for almost half a century while their resources were being plundered. Millions died. Finally, peace came, then independence. Peace didn't last. By 2013, another war was being fought, started by the south's political elite they were fighting over the South's vast oil wealth. The key findings are that um, crimes against humanity and war crimes have continued into 2015. As the poor suffered and died, the rich got wealthier. This is the story of their wealth and the regions that have helped plunder the South. The Profiteers. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I'm very rich. I don't have a problem. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I don't In 2016, this video popped up on the Facebook account of Lawrence Malong, or as he likes to call himself. Uh, <clears throat> for those guys uh, who don't know, uh, let me say it like this. For those guys who don't know me, uh, my name is Lawrence Walmalong Yor, uh, Lawrence Walmalong Yor Jr., aka Young Tycoon, uh, one of the African youngest billionaires. It's an eight-minute rant by Malong about people's comments that he is wicked because he has so much money. So the people look at wicked father of mine that uh, Lauren Lauren Malong Yor Jr. is uh, they only look at my wickedness father of mine that Lauren Malong Yor Jr. like to show off his wealthy and in social media and all these things. You know why only you look at my wickedness father? Why you don't look at my achievement fat like I donate a lot of money? Why you don't tell Lauren Lamalo you donate a lot of money to his school, to the church, to the Red Cross? Why you don't say that? Why you only say Lauren Lamalo you are show off with millions and billions of dollars in cash? Yes, yes, you see? Oh, oh, oh. The people who question his wealth may have a point. After all, he comes from South Sudan a country where one out of 10 people is a refugee, one of the poorest countries in the world. But he lives an unapologetic life of luxury. But if he's the young tycoon, his father is king. Paul Malong Awan, also known as King Paul in South Sudan, is widely known for his immense wealth allegedly from the ownership of businesses in Uganda and South Sudan. But he stands accused of embezzlement of millions of dollars from South Sudan by none other than his former ally and boss, current president, Salva Kiir. South Sudan's ruling elite is dominated mainly by two tribes, the majority Dinka from where President Salva Kiir comes from and the Nuer, 
the tribe that rebel turned vice president turned rebel and now vice president elect again Riek Mashar comes from. Until 2017, below Salva Kiir was Paul Malong. Malong was the chief of general staff of the Sudan People's Liberation Army. Once thought of as South Sudan President Salva Kiir's successor, he is said to have used his power brutally and with no remorse. In 2015, while chief of staff of the army, Malong is alleged to have commanded troops that perpetrated brutal murders, rape, torture, and the forced displacement of over 50,000 people. He is now on a United Nations sanctions list for these crimes. If you live in Kenya, here's why Malong's story is important. He roams freely here in Kenya. This is his home. According to multiple security sources that I have spoken to, it is supposedly guarded by members of Kenya's armed forces. Pictures taken by one of these sources with access to Malong's home show a property and cars that betray the level of comfort he has. Is Kenya offering protection to Paul Malong? Kenya does not offer protection to crime because Kenya does not protect crime. Uh, in fact, it would be, it would be posterous for anybody to imagine that Kenya we would go out of our way to protect crime. So if you are asking me whether Kenya would be a party to the deliberate commission of crime and then make effort to protect that, that crime or that the commission of a crime, then definitely the, the, the answer is no. I'm not asking about Kenya's role in the commission of crimes in South Sudan. No, you, you're basically condoning because if you're protecting, if you protect a person who has committed a crime, then you become um, party to the crime. You become an accessory to the, to, to, to the crime. And I'm telling you that Kenya would not, would not uh, uh, be party to that. Kenya's police seem reluctant to investigate a man who is on the run from his own government, targeted internationally, and accused of some of the most heinous crimes. If a foreign national commits crimes of that sort of nature, yeah. Is there no obligation by a local agency, um, being part of a country that is a signatory to the UN Charter on Human Rights, to pursue that person? You, pers you, 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 pursue, you, 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 that. you cannot pursue a person on rumours. Mm. You pursue a person These on rumours. No, what I'm saying, mm. any, any matter that has not been brought to your attention as a country on official capacity, mm -hmm. you treat it as a rumour. Even if it was brought before the UN Security Council? Even if it is brought before the UN Security Council, there must be communication. Mm -hmm. Yes. How does a man who's accused of so much live freely in Kenya? One answer may be in Malong's alleged close ties to Kenya's leadership. Four months before Salva Kiir sacked Malong for allegedly refusing peacekeepers to access the conflict zones in South Sudan, he was hospitalized at the Nairobi hospital. Among those who visited him on the 23rd and 24th of December, 2016 were President Uhuru Kenyatta and Deputy President William Ruto. On April the 9th, 2018, just a month after Kenyans witnessed their president and the main opposition leader shake hands after a bitter election, Malong was making rounds and shaking hands in Nairobi as well. He met with members of the Kikuyu Council of Elders and the Kalenjin Council of Elders. This was just days after launching a rebel movement, the South Sudan United Front. He launched it from Nairobi. We will begin a process of discussing what ails us and what creates division amongst us. President Kenyatta is currently leading a very public fight against corruption. With a friend like this, can he claim the moral credibility to fight the same vices Malong stands accused of. So I went to ask him about these allegations myself. Hello, Bariako. Yeah, I'm here to see uh, Bwana Malong. Bariako, sir. Mzuri sana. Kosalama? Kochonjo. Eh. 
Yako. Mambo vipi? Salama okay. kabisa. Mhm. Eh. Niambia. Ninaitwa Namu, uh -huh. I'm a journalist. Okay. Eh. Hala Namu ama? Ndio. Okay. Eh. Uh -huh. So I'd like to interview Mr. Malong. Okay. Yes. Ulikuwa na appointment na appointment na yeye. Uh -huh. Eh. Okay. Yeah. Alan, Alan, Labda utasubiri kwa gari kidogo eh. niongee naye. Okay. Mm. Sawa so, no problem. Sawa so, sawa. So. Okay. Yes, mbe. Eh. I'm sorry mkubwa yuko available sai. Eh. Maybe you book appointment maybe some other day. Can I leave my number for for me to yeah, be able to no uh. Two weeks after my first visit to his home, I went back hoping to deliver this letter with my questions to Paul Malong and interview him. It is because I wasn't able to get an appointment with him that I have written this letter. So all I want is to deliver this letter. I own him, my contacts are on there. He can respond about You just do this, me. write your contacts somewhere. My contacts are on the letter. My responsibility stops at this gate. Yes. I just want to be clear that you understand that. Yes, I understand. All right. I understand. Yes. Okay, fine. I understand. So what I will do, you don't have to pick it up. Someone will. But my responsibility has now been. Has now been. You know you cannot force whatever. I'm not forcing you to do yes, anything. I'm not yes, forcing you to read yes, the letter. Yes. Hello. 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 Hello with all of my questions to Mr. Malong. The person in that, uh, the, the security officer threw the, the letter in the trash in front of me and told me that he was not going to take the letter to Mr. Malong. I have given him my card. This is the second time that I have taken my contact details to Mr. Malong's property. If he does not choose to respond, then that is upon him. But I have, as far as I can, um, played my role as a journalist. Paul Malong is powerful well-connected, and according to the United Nations' description of his alleged crimes, a dangerous man. And if you live in Nyari, Nairobi, he might be your neighbor. But living like this is expensive. How do the elite from a country that is still at war with itself manage to live lives that most Kenyans cannot afford? The unfolding investigation into the murder of a young Kenyan lady begins to answer this question by showing the ease with which South Sudan's political and military elite can shift their wealth throughout East Africa. Monica Kimani was a lady who seemed to have it all, beauty, wealth, and a lifestyle of apparent comfort. But on the 21st of September, she was murdered in cold blood, allegedly by this man, Joseph Irungu. Officers close to the investigation claim that a large amount of money in US dollars was stolen from her apartment on the night of her murder. Who did it belong to? Kenya's largest local daily, The Daily Nation, has reported about a South Sudanese man who allegedly is behind some of the wealth that Monica was able to accumulate. Details are also emerging from the investigation that the money she is said to have had belonged to this man, Lieutenant General Daniel Awet Akot, the current Deputy Speaker of South Sudan's Legislative Assembly. Monica and the 70-year-old Awet allegedly met while he was the governor of Rumbek State in South Sudan. Monica is said to have gained his trust and Awet eventually trusted her with the management of his properties in Nairobi, Kenya. On what would be her last trip to Kenya before her murder, it's also alleged that Monica was carrying large amounts of cash, far above the maximum amount of hard currency one is allowed to take out of South Sudan. But Awet allegedly used his influence to grant her safe passage. But not all of South Sudan's leaders who live outside their country live like Malong. Yeah, this is where I'm sleeping currently. Yeah. 
Yes. This is, um, like I said, this is, this is something that you would hardly ever expect from a member of parliament. Yeah. I worked and then later on uh, elected by my people in the constituents to represent them in the parliament. I was not voted out. No election since I was voted in. There has never been any election. We have been displaced from home. We are now here, refugee, as poor as we see, but this is a home now. This is home, you know. We tuned to VOA, uh, South Sudan in focus. Myself personally, I, I worked in the government, but I've never had chance of making money that can enable me to uh, make life in other places like that. So it makes me sometimes think that something went wrong. Maybe you, 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 you stole money from somewhere. It's almost as if every 10 minutes you drive in Kampala, you see an SSD or South Sudanese number plate. Yes. And often the license plate will be on a car that is massive, V8 and above. We're driving through Buziga, a plush suburb in Uganda's capital, Kampala. South Sudan's elite seem to like living here too. Yeah, that one belongs to a former minister from South Sudan. Which one? This one right here. Yes. So we're headed uh, back to the home of uh, Stephen Dudao, who was a former oil minister and current finance minister in South Sudan. Uh, he bought a house here and uh, one of the documents that we've seen shows that he paid at least $60,000 in deposit for it. Of course, buying from uh, Uganda. With me in the car is Lagu Joseph. Lagu is one of South Sudan's best-known investigative journalists. He's written about scandals and theft that allowed South Sudan's elite to buy homes in countries around the world. I'll tell you more about Joseph in a few minutes. How, though, do these people pay for all their expensive homes and toys? Mainly two words, money laundering. Laundering money works in different ways, but in South Sudan, it was quite straightforward. Senior political or military elites used their influence to access government money either through opening up of shell companies proposing to deliver certain goods or services to the government and to the people. They would win tenders and then not deliver on the goods or services as promised. Or as was discovered by US-based investigative initiative, The Sentry, Companies doing business in South Sudan would deposit money directly into the accounts of these senior officials. Once the money hit the accounts of these individuals, they would buy themselves properties and capitals around the world through those same accounts. I know of an individual, this is a clear story, this individual came, he was asked, we want to, hire, to rent your house. They say, he said, um, you can rent it. Then they asked him, is it possible we can buy the house? He said, no, I'm not selling it. He said, if you had to sell it, how much would you sell it? Then he said, I can, well, maybe $300,000. He said, oh, okay, come to Sheraton Hotel and pick the money. And the gentleman couldn't say, no, that's, uh, let's go to the bank and you deposit the money. The person deposited the money in the bank and he called his girlfriend and told her, pack up a few things of ours and we leave because the house has been bought. South Sudan's immediate former finance minister, Stephen Judao, who also served as a minister for petroleum while a minister, earned $6,600 a month or $79,200 a year. But in 2015, Dudao's family moved into the plush Buziga suburb. Dudao paid $60,000 as a final installment for the house. This was for just one installment. It's not clear how much the land he was buying cost, but estimates from the area put the average cost of a home or land in Buziga at between $150,000 to 300,000 US dollars. More telling is when the final installment was paid in April 2015. 
in the middle of a military offensive where evidence gathered by US-based investigative initiative The Sentry show that while he was petroleum minister, over 225 million US dollars in revenues from the sale of South Sudan's crude were being shifted from his ministry to Nilepet, a government-owned oil company that was paying the Padang Dinka militia in an offensive back in South Sudan. The United Nations has blamed the Padang Dinka militia for all sorts of crimes, mass murder, rape, and targeted destruction of property. True to form, Dudao's family was safe in Kampala. Some of his children were posting pictures on Facebook from inside this same property. This copy of a check shows at least $30,000 of the money paid for the property was transacted through Dudao's equity bank account. Yeah, actually, based on the period that he has actually served as a minister, of finance and then of course uh, petroleum, uh, he is unable to raise the money that can buy this house because his salary is actually around 24,000 per month, SSP. So buying this house actually need investigation simply because that money is too much. And Wealth stashed behind high walls has been a focus of some of Joseph's investigations into South Sudan's elite. But his own story is one that millions of South Sudan's average citizens share. Joseph is a refugee. I came to refugees in 1998 when I was still a child. So, and I grew in refugees. I studied as a refugee. And I went back. I lost my job simply because I was forced out of my country. I don't know by this time how I could be in my office, in my place of work, because I was doing very well. So unfortunately, uh, most of my time, I'm actually cut off from my family. My family is in the refugees camp, and then of course I have to be in town because I cannot live with my wife, with my children, including my mom and then my dad. Joseph is lucky to have escaped. Many journalists, like Joseph's best friend, Peter Moy, never made it out. This is the guy actually who was actually killed, that is Peter. I used to call him my mentor because he was ahead of me when I joined the field of journalism. He normally gave me directions, everything. So immediately he was suddenly shot dead. When it reaches to 8 o'clock, then of course his dad again called me that Joseph Moi is dead. So when I rushed to the ground, I found indeed his body was lying on the ground. So I really feel the pain because this is the guy whom I actually got him in the field and he was ahead of me. I call him as my mentor because he was really providing me the necessary support. Joseph now lives with his younger sisters and aunt in a two-bedroom house that his late brother owned. Life here is a struggle. If they are paying their school fees, they pay one full year, others then they pay from, if you have joined senior, and they pay from senior up to senior for the pay of fees. As for us, there is no money. We keep on chasing, chasing. The opulence, most of them are children of, 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 of current and former ministers in South Sudan. The opulence by which they live. It's it, as compared to children of ministers of, in Uganda who would, you would think would also be living an opulent life. It's not comparable, not even for a second. I don't care what you say. We will begin a process. This is where I'm sleeping currently. A car that is massive. I grew in refugees. 